name is uh, Kenny. Uh, uh, my, my dancing name is Ken Swift, and I'm from New York City. First of all, I always teach breaking, but in the last couple of years, I, you know, after doing a lot of research and training, you know, uh, I decided to start teaching rock also because I had some injuries. So I started teaching rock and freestyle based on the perspective and, and interpretation of the way uh, a lot of the people from the Seven Gems uh, New York City chapter, the, the rock dance division, uh, dances. So I'm kind of like carrying their uh, tradition as I teach, carrying the tradition of, uh, of rock and freestyle. So when I talk about underground dance, <clears throat> You know, I say two dances, you know, I say rocking and I say breaking because through my history, you know, over the years I've saw the connection and met people and danced with people. And in the context of what hip hop culture is, you know, uh, I choose to share them both together because they're connected to each other. So I, I see rocking and, and breaking as underground dance because they were dances that, you know, weren't really popular to, you know, uh, you know, the, the masses, you know, they were, you, you weren't, when you saw Breaking back in the days, you didn't see it like on TV and everywhere, you know, in schools or whatever, you, it was underground, you didn't see it much at all, you know, uh, so it was kind of underground. When, you know, the media came and exploded breaking and rocking and, and popping and, and funk styles and all that, with all the movies in the 80s, that's when it kind of became overground, <laughs> you know, because now it was exposed to everybody. So I say underground dance because, it was within the community, and the community understood the language of what it was, not necessarily normal people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the comp basically back in the days, it wasn't breaking competitions, it was dance competitions. You know, the ones that I remember, I remember because I entered uh, a dance competition. Uh, it was a Halloween party. Uh, 1981, 1980, I think it is, 80, probably 80, and it was up in River, uh, near Riverdale on 207th Street, and it was at a, at like a, um, a hall where, you know, they had some social group, uh, Elk, Elks Club or something, you know, it was their building that they did these type of meetings and everything, but they used it on the weekends to throw parties. So they threw a Halloween party and they had a dance contest for $100 and a trophy. And uh, I went up there with uh, Kid Terrific, my older brother, a bunch of his friends, and also uh, Crazy Legs. And we entered. And we entered the contest. We were the, we, we just, we, you know, two, we, we, we did breaking. Everybody else was doing the hustle. So the other three groups were hustle groups, and me and Legs did some footwork. We did a little routine, and we did one solo each, and that was it. And after, when, when it was over, we won. We won the contest. So that, that is kind of like the perspective. When it came to really solid, like, breaking contest, you know, that came a little bit later. You know what I mean? Um, we would say battle, you know. We would say b-boy battle or something like that because, uh, you know, that's what it really nailed down to. When you look at Lincoln Center, when you look at, USA roller skating rink and the battles between dynamic rockers uh, and rock steady, you're looking at, you know, just battles, b-boy battles. They weren't really like a breaking event. Now we have breaking events. Over the years, breaking events became a thing. But before it was just jams and it was uh, just b-boy battles. You know, like, we're going to meet at this roller skating rink and we're going to battle. Tell everybody, you know, tell your friends. And that's what it was about, you know, like... Um, but over time, you know, the, the most one that was really kind of exposed on a larger level towards being close to an event was the Lincoln Center battle with Dynamic and Rocksteady. You know, like where I'm concerned, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I come from the tradition of going to a party and dancing. You know, like there's a moment to dance you know, let me do what I want to do so I can get some attention, you know, maybe get some, some like, like a girl to notice me doing something so I could, you know, because I was shy when I was a kid. I didn't really know how to talk to girls. So when you do like a little move in a party, sometimes you catch the eye of somebody and it makes it easier for you to socialize, you know what I'm saying, to, to, be, to be a part of something and then maybe even dance with somebody, you know. 
uh, it wasn't just about breaking, going in a party and breaking. It was about going in a party and dancing in general. You know, you didn't just, I mean, that, that's not real to walk in a party and just start breaking. You know, uh, it, it was more like, you know, current dance steps, you know, the Patty Duke or the Bump or, you know, the Gigolo or stuff like that. You know, just getting into what was popular when you dance with someone, with a girl most likely. So, yeah, I mean, going, going to these things, you, you're going to progress because, you know, you, you, you're, you're getting the raw experience. You know, you're, you're getting the moment and learning how to get the reaction. I mean, you can go on a jam and do something and nobody even reacts. You know, people look at you like you're whack or they don't, they're not impressed. So going to the parties, you know, it's a lot of pressure. You know, and a contest is one thing, but a party is like you got average normal people that are just looking at you. And they can, you know, they're either going to like you or they're not. And they don't have to like you if they don't want to, you know. So, but yeah, you progress. I wasn't into really competitions that much. Um, just the setup battle, you know, like, oh, we're we supposed to battle these dudes or let's go to this roller skating rink, you know, and break. And usually we would go and there would be other people that broke too. And that's when the battle, a lot, organic, you know, just, just happened, you know. Um, but, uh Without going to competitions and just being in the circle all the time, yeah, I mean, you get better. The more you do it, you get better. So you're definitely going to progress. I think the competitions are good, but it's a, it's a diff competition is different from that, that moment where it really isn't premeditated. Like, you're not really trying to, you know, you know have this whole objective. Like, it happens raw and naturally. That, that's more of where I come from. So uh, I entered three competitions in my life, that, that first one, and then I entered a Smurf contest with my brother Chino, and we won the Smurf contest because we did some breaking. We did the spider and the turtle. And then in, uh, I think it was 99, we, uh, I entered with some guys from the States in a, a battle in Korea, Korea World Cup, and uh, we took first place in Korea. That was probably the, you know, since the 80s, the only battle, uh, the only contest I entered. And I didn't even want to do it. You know, they were asking me, my friends asked me, and I was like, all right, whatever. And I knew it beforehand because I don't like being alone on a big stage. I like to be with everybody, all the energy up near me. You know, I don't like to be, my, my, the, the particular way that I like to break is small, quick transitions and combinations and footwork, most likely, uh, mixed in with all the other moves. So it's not as dynamic visually when you're alone. It doesn't take up as much space as a high-powered power move combination where it moves all over the place and it's beautiful and big. Mine is more refined to small circles and, and smaller areas. So every time I dance alone, you know, on a stage and everybody's far away and the audience is far away, I don't really feel, I don't feel what I feel when I'm in a circle. So even though I didn't want to enter the contest, we entered and we ended up winning. Thank goodness. That was a good thing. But since then, I was like, nah, I don't really like contests. I don't like to enter them. I would say that if you choose not to do footwork, if you don't want to do it, I mean, if you do footwork and it's, it sucks and it's whack, I mean, still peace, you're still doing footwork. I'll give you respect. I mean, everybody has to get better. But if you don't have footwork in your vocabulary of what you're doing, you don't, there's no footwork. I don't really see, see that as, you know, being, having the ability to call yourself a B-boy or a B-girl because footwork is the core. To me, footwork is the, probably the most raw thing that happened first was run, that spastic running around the body. That context of running around your body and twisting fast f for one solo and then stopping never happened until you know, the 70s when that happened. That was a different way of approaching dance for the, for the era with the music and the fashion and everything that the 70s had. So that is the raw essence. Like I remember seeing footwork and being, what the hell is that? I couldn't compare it to gymnastics. I couldn't compare it to anything that I seen already on TV or in, you know, anywhere, I was like, that's crazy. So, but then I saw the, the moves, single moves, like a chair or, you know, and I was like, that's, that shit is crazy too, I like that. But you know, after watching it a few times and then hanging out with a couple of the fellas, you could see that you needed to have dope footwork. Like your footwork had to be dope because that's what set up all your moves, the footwork. So I say, you know, if you don't, if you like, if your attitude is like you don't need footwork or you don't want to do footwork, you don't have a, a proper education. And if you don't have a proper education to understand the fundamentals, I don't think you have the, I don't think you should call yourself a B-boy or B-girl. I mean, it's part of the law. It's like, if you're gonna learn an art form, learn the art form. If you're gonna take one thing from the art form and then fuse it with a thousand other things, that's not B-boying, that's not breaking, that's not B-girling to me. 
It's uh, fusion. It's, it's freestyle. You know what I'm saying? It's like jazz or just movement. You know, music is the key to this. It's, it's, it's combined with all this, the elements of what breaking is. And um, I think we should all just play by the rules. Even though we evolve and we never said you can't evolve, you're allowed to evolve and be, expand and be interesting and abstract. But at the same time, you know, you got to have specific things within the vocabulary that you can identify as breaking. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, for the record, this is my opinion on what I see in my research and also the way I feel about my passion for my art form. This is not about contradicting anybody, you know, uh, and saying you're wrong or I'm saying what I feel, you know, after 30, 38, 39 years of doing this and seeing it exactly for what it is all this time, when I see someone change it out of nowhere after all this information and uh, structure is built, I, I have to speak up and say, well, that's not actually proper and accurate. You know, in breaking, we try to be particular with terminologies. We try to be particular to let people know what the content is. We have things called footwork. We have things called power moves or air moves or freezes. We have this whole language that we've established since the beginning. And, you know, in the last five years or six years, you know, there's been these motions for people to just take the top rock terminology from a complete package, which is top rock footwork freezes, spins on all parts of the body and things you do in the air, and just take one aspect out of it and make it a contest, I, was, I couldn't understand why. And I wasn't debating the dance steps. I was saying the context is wrong, like, because the dance steps aren't the issue. There's a lot of people that top rock and break, and it's dope, and there's a lot of people that top rock and break, and the top rock sucks. That's not what I'm talking about if your top rock is whack. I'm saying if you use the word top rock, and you don't go down to the floor, it's not top rock. That's top style or rocking or freestyle, which dances, the dances that existed already. So my, my whole, I, I took offense because in New York classic style dance, rock and freestyle from the, some say late 60s and early 70s, we had these dances that were dope, rock and freestyle, you know what I'm saying? So then breaking came along and took all the energy away from it because it was new and radical and it was more catchy to the eye and abnormal. It was crazy to see breaking. So, you know, that's, that, that's, that's the history we have. And for someone to just call something top rock and people are basically rocking and freestyling and skip the tradition of rock and freestyle and leave it out the equation and just take a word top rock and make a contest out of it, it's offensive. It's offensive to the history, to the pioneers. It's offensive to all the old rock dancers that helped create this beautiful dance that we don't have legitimate rock dance contests, we don't have legitimate freestyle rock contests, and we don't even have, like, basically what, what a top rock contest is around the world is just a top style contest because people are playing crazy music, they're doing mixing house and locking and popping and top rock and jerks. So it's, it's a freestyle, which, I, which more, more looks like to me in this day, a top style, a top style contest. So I relate to all these contests as top style contests, top styles, you know? Um, because the vocabulary word of top rock is married to going down to the floor and doing footwork and, and doing the elements of breaking. And we should have never separated them. And I say this because of my convictions are because I've been doing this all my life and it never happened. And I, and I, and I say it and people get mad at me. They're looking at me like, oh, you're a hater. Yo, you don't want to support. Blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm not a hater. I'm standing up for my culture. I'm standing up for what I believe in my art. You know, I think I, it's just, it, it bothers me. You know, it's like, oh, and it's like, you know, what happened to breaking? What, you don't like breaking? All of a sudden you want to take a little piece of what you like and you don't want to go down to the floor? You're the ones that are hating on the style. Use a different word for that shit, you know? Like, they, when they do, they do these big events, you know, that they don't have no breaking in the event, but they have every other dance style, right? That's your, that's your choice. You want to do an event, just, uh, you know, all the other great styles, whacking, popping, locking, house, freestyle, hip-hop, hip-hop, you know, et cetera, but you don't want to break, that's your choice. But at the end of the day, don't take top rock and put it in your contest because you're, you're, you're violating the rules of hip-hop culture. Top rock to me are the dancing, bouncing, dancing steps that you do before you break. And of course I said it. I said if we were in a contest right now and someone walked to the middle of the floor, not on the beat, went down to the floor and just started doing footwork, there may be someone that would say, 
well, you can't really advance because you didn't, you know, you didn't do tap rock. You know, like, you can't just do that, you know. You're, maybe your breaking was good, but you can't just, that's like, everybody be like, what's wrong with this guy? People would look at you like you don't know what you're doing. And that would be a, a fact. You don't know what you're doing because you're supposed to dance first and go down. So we, we wouldn't allow that. We wouldn't let nobody get away with that shit. If I was a judge, I'd be like, well, you're dope, but nah, the other dude, <laughs> he did what he had to do. You just walked to the middle and you broke. He, you know, we would step up for that. But now it's like, all right, to use the word top rock and not go down to the floor and nobody says anything. So for me, I took this approach the last few years and I got the controversy. A lot of people didn't understand what I was trying to say. They didn't really get my approach. Now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an advocate for fusion, you know, and being creative and breaking. We never said you can't be really creative and abstract and take from everywhere. We always said in breaking, we don't always say it, but the whole idea since I was a kid is that you could take from everywhere. You know what I'm saying? So my thing isn't saying you should top rock like this because B-boys top rock that way. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you use the word top rock, top rock, you have to break. Now, there's other people that feel differently, and I respect what other people feel, but it's my obligation. It's my responsibility as a, as a pioneer, someone that loves this art form, to speak up. Cause who am I if I don't speak up about what I believe? Like, what type of man would I be if I just said, yo, it's cool, you know, let me, let me enter that shit, you know, like. So I don't blame young people, but when I have my platform and I'm in my classes, without offending anybody, I have to share that, you know, and sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes, there's times that I'm just like, I just, I'm tired of saying it, you know, because nobody gives, gives a shit. And people keep doing these fucking contests all around the world. And it's like, all right, whatever. You know, to me, it's just like, Fine. So, but like I said, I mean, it's not to offend anybody or anybody's beliefs and opinions, but I never heard that word ever before. When you had rocking and freestyle, that was done on top, but the word top wasn't used. It was called rocking or freestyle. When I heard the word top rock, it related straight to breaking for 40 years, you know, to breaking. I never heard an old rock dancer say, yo, this is top rock. Rock dancers say, this is freestyle, let me show you the rock. You know, that's the way their language is. Their language didn't have top rock in it. The, lack, the terminology of top rock and the language and the definition behind it connected itself to breaking when breaking was born. So that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's what I want people to understand. So my thing is that it would be dope if they just said, you know, just really looked at it and respected it, you know, and choose to use a different uh, word for it. I don't think the contest is nothing wrong with it when people get up and dance on top with each other, you know, but call it top styles, you know, make up a new word, call it what the fuck you want to call it, but don't call it top rock, because it's, to me, it's like, doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, it's, we all know what's going on when, when we, when we take elements, and it's entertainment, you know what I'm saying, this is a skill, it's a skill, a windmill is a skill, a head spin is a skill, you know, and when, when we have that pride about our skills, when the whole package of breaking, that's pride. You know, you want to show the world that you can break and you could do it all. When events do this type of thing, it, it, it does have its thing where you're like, oh, well, I mean, you know, why are they just taking the head spin? But I, I understand it. I understand that individuals still want to show their head spin. You know, so let me show you how I do it. You know, when I see these, comp these little particular competitions, like, Head spins, swipes, flares, blah, blah, blah. I understand it and I get it. My whole thing is that I just want to see you still do the thing you're supposed to do, which is top rock into it and do the package and do, you know, because you're showing one skill. You know, back in the days, it was very, very um, common to see someone do top rock and windmills and they're finished. So it's not like this is a new thing. You know, I, I, I don't like, you know, if someone just walked out and sat on the floor and goes, Wimble, wimble, wimble. You know, I'm like, all right, well, you know, you didn't put it together. You know, it looks beautiful when you put it all together with the top rock and then you show your windmills. Back in the days, it was, it was common. People go top rock, head spin, head spin, head spin, and you're finished. Even in the 90s, that was still happening. So when I see it now, I get it, you know, and it's entertainment and people love it. And for average audiences, it's great. You know, it's, it's, it lets you see directly, something directly, the skill and precision you know, balance, strength, you know, and, and uh, 
energy that it does to, for the body to do something crazy like that, so I understand it. I'm not, I'm not against it. I think street, when they say, it's a description of, of what people see. You know, it's wordplay. Sometimes it's wordplay. Street dance, I mean, Wiggles used to say something interesting in the 90s, like, because a lot of the media would say, these street dancers, and, and Wiggles would be like, nah, we don't dance in the street. <laughs> we dance in a party or in a club or in a roller skate. You know, like, they made it street. A street, he, he, he would say, if we dance in the street, we get hit by a car. That's what Wiggles used to say. So, I mean, that's, that's the wordplay thing that it, it's interesting about it. What, what people want to say is these dances that come from the community. You know, this is community dance or underground dance. That's, to me, that, that kind of makes more sense than saying street dance. And sometimes that ha can sound like it has negative kind of edges to it, street dance. You know, like, and, and, and in all actuality, you know, they're, they're just dances that came from the community, the raw dances that came, you know, from the people in the community, you know, at a specific time in history. So, yes, the transition through that period, you, these dances su survived the test of time, so they went into the studio. They made their way into the studio and into MTV and into the world and onto, you know, YouTube and the, and, and the, the information superhighway. So, I mean, it's, it's so much more exposed now that, yeah, it's understandable to, uh, to uh, see people say the word street dance, you know, but my take on it is that, you know, if they, you know, to call that shit the whole realm of it street dance, I don't think that's fair and it's, it, it's sometimes. I understand it, the description, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know I, I don't know what the better word is. I, I'd rather just be called what it is. If it's locking, it's locking. If it's whacking, it's whacking. If it's breaking, it's breaking. You know, uh, that's what I prefer. So street dance is kind of, you know, it's, it's, I understand it. I don't have a problem with it, but it's like street dance. You know, it, it almost sounds like it shouldn't be, it, it's not as good as other, like why are we separating it to the street? It's another dance, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't really study the last hundred years of dance. That's not my thing. I study breaking, <laughs> that's the dance that I come from. So it's like, you know, if, if a dance was made a hundred years ago, you know, and it was in the city, you know, does that mean that it's a street dance, you know, you know, some dances are, are just part of a, 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 an experience in time that starts growing from, from, what, from music, of course, and, and people uh, gathering together and people wanting to have a nice time and also show what they can do with their uh, dancing. So street dance is a, a marketable term, you know, uh, to, to put it in a specific place and... Uh, and it's, that's what it is, you know. I, I you know, I, I don't use that term much, but that's what it is. What specific is the time period? There's the music that was playing, you know. If there was music playing when cavemen were, you know, they were banging on shit, whatever. We don't know. It's not. It wasn't James Brown. It's all exclusive to the time period. Hip hop is what it is because of the time period, the what people wore, the music that was being played you know, the ways people danced. There's nothing new in hip hop. It's, it's, you know, it's something that's been happening with people and art for since the beginning of time, probably, where people express themselves in certain ways, you know. So, you know, poetry, you know, instruments, dance and painting, you know, I mean, it's not a new thing. Uh, but what's significant to hip hop, you know, is the language, it's the language, the way people talked, the way people expressed themselves, the music people heard, you know, uh, the, the things, the colors and, you know, things people saw to inspire them to paint, you know, the technology, you know, like turntables are <laughs> technology, you know, they didn't have turntables, you know, like 400 years ago, you know what I'm saying? So it's all specific, hip hop is specific to the time period, in my opinion. This is what makes it significant, you know. Uh, and 40 years from now, you know, we're gonna reflect on this. The world is gonna look back 40 years from now and say, well, that's hip hop, you know, because this is the time period when it started. The same way we can say, well, I guess, you know, uh, tap, you know, we could read books and look into history and see tap started in a specific place. That's, you know, so many years ago. We can relate to that historically and understand it. That's what it's always going to relate to in the history of hip hop. It's going to come back to the 70s and the 80s, primarily the 70s, which developed this underground subculture to come together in the 80s to be hip hop culture.
Well, I mean, I'm an affiliate of Zulu Nation. I, I was connected with Zulu Nation uh, because, of, because of breaking. You know, I'm, I'm from Manhattan. I'm from Harlem. I'm not, from, I'm not from the Bronx. I didn't know about Zulu Nation where I was at. I may have heard it, but didn't, re didn't understand what it meant and didn't connect myself to it. Uh, when, you know, Rocksteady Crew became part of Zulu Nation through, you know, as Zulu Kings, as dancers, b-boys for, for Zulu Nation at that time, we still maintained our identity as Rocksteady. We were Rocksteady Zulu Kings. So we still had our identity, and, uh, you know, we weren't going to let that go. I mean, they, you know, bam, you know, and the Zulu Nation, when they saw us, they, they respected what we did, you know, and we respected what, what the movement that Zulu Nation is. So that was our collaboration. Um, you know, I, I went to Zulu meetings in the beginning. I was a very young kid, and they, I would go to the Bronx River. I went to a few of them, see the people up there, you know, like a classroom setting, and, and people are building and exchanging information and talking about serious things. I was maybe 15 years old. Some of the times I would go up there, I would be like, it was a little too much for me. I was so much into creativity and having fun that a lot of that wasn't exciting to me. I was, you can call it, I was maybe a little bit ignorant, maybe a bit too much energy, but that wasn't something that I really understood how important that was at that age. As I got older, I started understanding, it's like, oh shit, this is what's, what's really good. But so that at that time, I wasn't really drawn to the Zulu nation side of it, the lessons and the beliefs. I wasn't really magnetized by that because I was young and I was in love with the street hanging out, you know, doing graffiti and doing whatever. But uh, I would go to the, a few, I went to two, two of the old uh, big Zulu anniversaries. Uh, the one that stands out to me was at the Kips Bay Boys Club. I think it was the, shit. I forgot what number. I, I wanna say seventh anniversary, but I might, it might be, maybe 9th or 10th, but we went up there and we got busy and, you know, it was dope. And, uh, I mean, it, it was just packed with a lot of people. There was a couple of fights, you know, some drama outside. Uh, you know, it was kind of rowdy, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it had a bit of everything in it, you know what I mean? Pe you had the whole community in this big community center packed, dope music playing. So, you know, when people interact with each other, you know, it is what it is in the street. But, uh, but nah, the energy was there, you know, Zulu Nation always has uh, represented super, you know, high respect level to the, the, the bands and the music and the artists that, you know, that, that created this beautiful music in the 60s and 70s and celebrated them. They've always done anniversaries, they celebrate Sly and the Family Stone or James Brown or Parliament Funkadelic, you know, it's always about acknowledging and also sharing with that with the community through, through playing their music. Um, so on that level, I, I represent, I'm affiliated with Zulu Nation on an artistic perspective. You know, I, I connect myself to Zulu because of my history. I was a, a b-boy cat and I hung out and, you know, that was an experience in my life that I'm never going to forget. It was really fun. Uh, I still support Zulu Nation on behalf of their, what they do in the community worldwide. It's a very positive movement, you know what I'm saying? And, and I, I, can, I have to salute the people that put the real work in to, to make sure that everything is transferred around the world to where it's about consciousness. It's about hip hop culture and consciousness. You know, a lot of communities, you know, things aren't the best. You know, there's a lot of hoods in the world, you know, and a lot of young people need guidance sometimes, and you're not gonna get it sometimes from school. The things that Zulu, you know, really digs into are deep. And it's, it's interesting, because you learn a lot that you may not learn in school, because, you know, it's a different form of uh, reaching people through, through consciousness, you know. And so that's where that stands. But the Zulu anniversaries, you know, they, you know, they, they've always been a place for people to come and hang out and, and, and salute and pay respect and homage to hip hop culture. Well, you said the right word, rapper. You know, I mean, because the MC is really the, the kind of root of, you know, the understanding of, of of the art of emceeing being a, one of the elements of hip hop culture. So yeah, I mean, it's evolution and it's, it's media. You know, a rapper is into producing music and getting a record deal and, you know, following what the, the streets are saying or doing or trying to put a message out to the streets or the, the world. So the objective of the rapper is different. You know, they're, they're being groomed in a, in, a, in a studio with, uh, you know, microphones and, you know, uh, boards and shit and, and you know it 
it's just a different thing now, and it's an evolution of, of the art. Of, it's, it's emceeing evolution, which became rap music production and rap culture. And yeah, there's a lot of people that aren't conscious and don't care about uh, connecting emceeing to hip hop culture. There's people that think hip hop is rap. You know, there's people that think that hip hop, you know, when you any dance you do that's you know coming from the community is hip hop. You know, and I. It's understandable when you when you don't have the facts and the right information. I understand when people say it because they don't know. Um, <clears throat> breaking has evolved very beautifully. You know, I mean, breaking has a direct thing where the competitive side of it is very direct. You know, I think there's a lot of conscious rappers that exist. I think there's a lot of conscious MCs that exist. But are they getting exposed to the world? Maybe not. You know. I don't like a lot of the rap that's out now. I, I just, I don't, you know, I, I understand it in a sense, but don't like it. It doesn't give me the feel of the celebrative feel of, feel of hip-hop. It doesn't. And maybe it shouldn't. Maybe I'm just older. You know, like, you know, these dudes getting old, and, you know, we always say, I'm getting, I feel like I'm getting old. But, you know, it's normal for us to not really understand music that is not from our generation. Every generation is going to say, my, my music for my generation is the best. 20 years from now, you know, there's going to be a new generation of, of uh, people doing music. And 20 years from that point, they're going to be like, well, this new shit is whatever. But from 2030, that was the good music. You know, so as time goes on, it's going to be like every decade passes. It's very similar. People have a mind state. I do know for a fact that the band aspect and bands playing and people, you know, being involved, that connection isn't as... It's not like it was in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know. It's changed. Technology has changed things. I mean, music producers are doing the whole thing by themselves and rapping by themselves. So, you know, the drummers and the horn sections and all this stuff have been kind of pushed out in some ways. Not everywhere. There's really good bands that exist uh, still as bands. But um, breaking, because it's so direct and it, you know, it's just, that competitive thing, man. It's like people thought breaking was going to die in the 80s. They were like, oh, it's going to be a few years and then it's over. Don't worry. It's going to come in like the Frisbee or, you know, the hula hoop and it's going to be finished, you know. And they ridiculed it. And I remember we were like, damn. But, you know, the media has that power. The media can control your thoughts. And it's like people said breaking died in New York City. That's bullshit. The, the idiots that said breaking died in New York in the 80s, they're straight up trying to they're doing what <laughs> bad media does. They're putting out a message that's bullshit. I never stop breaking. Breaking isn't a thing like, oh, is it popular? I should still do it. Oh, it's not popular. I'm not going to do it now. Breaking is a feeling from the heart and the soul. Once you learn it and you do it, it's, you do it whenever you want to do it, whenever the moment presents itself. I mean, no matter what generation you're from. If you really love breaking, you're going to do it when you want to, and nobody's going to tell you no. Nobody's going to stop you. You're not going to let nobody stop you. If you were in any, anywhere and you hear Apache or you hear your favorite song and you, you, you feel like you, 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 got, you got to go, you're going to go. That's what breaking is about. So breaking never died. But the media try to say, you know, try, try to use it so much, television and film, and then they kind of let it go. Eh. So make it, the mindset is like, oh, it did, it died. But it never died, you know. And, you know, I mean, I could speak for myself. I'm not speaking for, but I could say New York City is a big, big city with a lot of people. And it's, it's retarded for someone to say breaking died in a community that spawned breaking, spawned the art form that birthed it, but also birthed all these young kids that saw it, that picked it up and kept on. You know, people picked it up and kept on in the 80s. It didn't stop, especially worldwide. You know, so breaking has always been doing what it does and the battle helps out a lot, the competitive side of it. The art of DJing is alive and well. The, you know, writing, writing culture and graffiti, it's evolved like all the elements. I think it depends on where you're at individually and where you're at uh, mentally and what part of the world you're at. Any part of the world, you're going to see a lot of people that know what the truth is and know what real hip-hop culture is and know how to practice each and connect it. And there's going to be a balance of people that don't care and don't connect breaking, you know, with emceeing and all that stuff. I mean, back in the days, you just did it because it was out there. Why wouldn't you try to write your name with style? Why wouldn't you try it? Like, it's something that is normal for you to try when you're young. 
you know. Uh, but, but you know, it's a new breed, and, and you know, like, uh, young people are going to be going to adapt to what's current in their life. Uh, a 12-year-old now is not going to feel, is in a different life now than a 12-year-old when I was, you know, back in 78. Everything was different than it is now. So the ideas are going to evolve, and the way things are going to move forward always going to be, you know, questionable to compare with the 70s and 80s and the 90s even. Because uh, the 90s was, music was still dope in the 90s, in my opinion. You know, they were still killing it uh, in hip-hop culture. But I don't know. I think there's control with uh, what, what the radio plays and all this stuff. So hip-hop is still alive. It's still there. There's good MCs, good DJs, good b-boys and all that. It's just that, you know, you got to go to a, a, a dope jam to see it. You know, you may not see it on TV. You may not hear it on the, uh, the radio station, you know, so... But breaking uh, your question, breaking save hip hop culture, I don't, I don't think it saved it. I think it's been uh, very responsible for keeping its tradition strong worldwide. In my experience coming into uh, start being being aware, being starting to be aware about what I dress is when I when I was younger. Uh, and it wasn't b-boy culture, okay? It was what people, you know, cool people wore. People, you know, people that wanted to look fresh. When they looked fresh, other people saw them looking fresh and was like, I want to look fresh. You know, or they might, you know, you might see someone come down and, you know, come somewhere and he's dipped. And be like, they'd be like, yo, that's dude. You know, like, that's this dude. And he might be popular, might be a DJ, whatever, you know, back in the day. So he's like, you check him out, you know, you're like, oh, that's the shit. You know, I remember, you know, the, the having a nice pair of sneakers was one of the first main ways of me starting to move forward in that consciousness. And this happened when I was 12. You know, um, my I dressed, you know, a specific way when I was younger because my mom shopped for me and my brothers. You know, I didn't I was the youngest. My mother was raising three boys. So when she had when, you know, she had to work to make money to, to buy us clothes you know, to, to make sure that we looked presentable, you know, to go to school or whatever. And a lot of times she would buy three of the same coat, <laughs> you know, the one with the hood, you know, cheap, you know, and that's the way it was in the 70s, you know. Uh, within that, you know, so a lot of what I was wearing was what was, you know, at that age range, uh, um, sensible dressing for a parent. When I, when I was able to save my dollars up and get my little dollars up, Pro Keds was the, was the sneaker that was cool. I was wearing a, a something like Jocks, J-O-X. They used to be, they were called Jocks. And there was a store called Tom McCann. And, you know, I, I would wear something like that. Or uh, what was the other ones that I was wearing? Uh, Specs, you know. And, but to graduate up, you go to Pro Keds. That made you was going, you was moving up and looking smooth. So I bought a pair of white Pro Keds. White canvas, white bottom with the blue and red stripe, you know, uh, the uptowns. And, um, you know, that was the beginning of that consciousness. Now, getting into writing culture, well, my, bro my brother's a writer. My, my, my middle brother's a writer. Getting into that whole scene opened my mind up to color, you know, to, to you know, connecting colors. You know, when you do pieces and you do blends, you're making sure your colors match and they blend with each other. So the consciousness kind of rolled into fashion. Seeing Doles, my boy Doles, draw cartoon, draw characters with the, you know, the flare bottom bleeds and the pro keds and all that, you know, the writing culture really enhanced my, my thinking of dress. And then just meeting people, like meeting specific people that were from, you know, different neighborhoods, you know, like, you know, my, my partner Dante, I grew up with, he was lived in my neighborhood, but he went to the Bronx, he went to the East Side, he went to, his mother was constantly moving. And as the years went on, he was up in the Bronx. He would come down dressed crazy. And I was like, I got to get that mock neck. I got to get them, them playboys. You know what I'm saying? That's, you, you, you just caught on to what was hip, what was cool. Now, was it b-boy fashion? No, it was kind of like what people wore in the street or what athletes wore. You might see a basketball player with a mock neck, nice blazer. You know what I'm saying? Or you might see, you know, a, a, a famous actor, you know what I'm saying, dressed up with a shearling or something, you know, and... and it's almost fantasy. It's almost like, you know, I want to I look like that and like I'm, like I'm successful and I'm dressed dipped, 
even though I'm poor. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's an interesting fantasy concept for being young. And it's amazing that a lot of kids, you know, 14, 15 year old kids were wearing clothing that was very expensive and very kind of fashionable. Trench coats, you know, shoes like dope shoes, you know. So, so for me uh, coming up in that particular time, it was interesting now, when you directly relate it to the, the, the art of breaking and, and, and getting down, a lot of those clothes worked very well for the dance. A mock neck, when a mock neck is dry, you could, on a wooden floor, you know, that's not a b-boy shirt. That's just a dope shirt. But it became something that you can spin good in. So that's one thing. Then you have nylons. The, the BVD nylons is like sleeping wear. You know, them too, when they're dried, you can get a nice spin with a that, you know, um, even the shoes, British walkers, British walkers, sh dope shoes, suede, or so leathers, or, or both, and you could, the, the rubber on the bottom, I used to break in British walkers, I would break on concrete with them, and you get, like, jumps, because it was rubber, caramel rubber, so, I mean, a lot of that wasn't designed for breaking, but you can easily, you know, take advantage of, um, I think with leaning towards maybe sport fashion and the track suit or the Adidas track suit, that kind of leaned more towards, you know, uh, something like, a, you know, it was street fashion. You know, like people all, of all elements and just cool people wore a dope Adidas suit. But you could recognize more B-boys. Sometimes you see a B-boy, a dude with a Adidas suit back in the days, you knew he was a B-boy. You know, as if he was dipped like that, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of like a lot of what I remember too, you know, because I always like to get, I felt real official when I had a dope full suit on. I felt official, you know, I felt like I was, I was righteous. Nice pair, kicks on, nice black, straight up black Adidas suit, white stripe, you know. So uh, I think athletically, you know, you know, it's as the evolution of the dance went on, athletic clothing have always been really, I relate athletic clothing very directly because it's, what we're doing is very, very physical. So a lot of that clothing actually is designed to be physical, you know. So I lean more towards, b-boy fashion might be leaning more towards, in my opinion, like that sport, sporty kind of look because it makes sense to do these crazy movements in clothing that can move like that. And, and you know, if you want it to be on the floor, it's not going to rip. It's not going to, you know, uh, make you stuck. It's going to help you do what you do. Look, when I was exposed to that stuff, it was a different time period, you know, and the variables and the situation that I was in at that age, I was exposed to it through, the, through, through hanging out. The hip hop had nothing to do, graffiti breaking, anything had nothing to do with my experience with that when I first did it. It was just, there was a moment where I was hanging out with some people and it happened and I did it to try to be a part of something, try to be cool, you know, and, you know, most people, as you got older, it was something that was, it was out there in the street, it was out there in the world, and you know, you, people did what they did. Um, and I never really, you know, like, things, you know, in the 70s, man, they would glorify sometimes drugs. You know, like, sometimes it made you look cool or prestigious if you was, like, cocaine was like, oh, you're successful in the Studio 54, you know, like, if you sniff cocaine, you're just, you made it, or you're just cool, nobody's gonna say shit because you can do that. Like, it didn't have, like, oh, you're fucking crazy, you know, as time went on, that, that feeling. Um, when I, when I, like, if you're in a tough situation in the street and your streets are tough and it, you get exposed to it, you know, that's one thing. But, but, but if you're, like, you know, a good kid with a good family, you know, you're not poor, you know, you come from a nice household, and, you know, people want to push that on you, you know, and you go for it. That's the part that I don't understand. I can understand if you get in a situation in the hood and, you know, it is what it is. You know, it's, it's not hip hop. It's like it, you, you could say yes or no. I got friends that never did that shit. And I got friends. Most of my friends did girls and guys. And it was a part of the life, teenage life, a, a hill that you have to cross over. Some cross the hill and they, they go on. Some get on the hill and they stay on the hill. I'm not going to judge a person that uses what they want to use. That's your personal choice to medicate yourself in the way you want to medicate yourself. I was one of the people that couldn't do it good. 
I was too hyper. I just, I had my experiences with drugs and they weren't good experiences. And I went through some shit. I went through some bad times with that in, in the streets of New York City. You know, so my story, you know, is different. So when I see good kids and they want to they wanna act all hard and, you know, and, and try to incorporate that with hip hop culture, try to incorporate it, I don't think it's cool. But I, I know it's normal for people to drink. I know it's normal for people to smoke. I mean, what the, the, what the consciousness of, of society knows about weed now is different than what it was. You know, like weed is medicine. It's truly medicine when you really study it properly. And if you use it properly, it's medicine. That's why in some parts of the world, you know, people use it with uh, MS, you know, people with body problems, sicknesses and diseases. They use the meds, they use weed. I have a friend that I grew up with since a kid. He was suffering from pain. He wasn't a b-boy cat, he was a regular dude. Tried everything in the book. The only thing that helped him out was the meds, the, the, the medicine, the, the cannabis. So over you know, 40 years, we've, we have a different consciousness now of it. You know? But you know, to connect it and think that you have to do it to be a part of hip hop, I don't think that's correct. You know, I'm not going to judge someone in hip hop that smokes weed. I'm not. That's your business. You know, everybody has their things. But uh, I don't think it should be something that solidifies you like you're cool. You're a dope b-boy if you do this. You know, if you do this, this makes you real. I don't think that's a good message. I think that if, you know, if you want to smoke a joint, you know what I'm saying, and makes you feel good, that's peace. You know, that's, a, that's something that you're taking resp responsibility as an adult to do. So we have that freedom and we have that right. Um, but to really glorify it in a sense that it makes you better or you could dance better if you drink or you could dance better if you smoke or you take a pill, that's, that's not accurate to me. So I'm not throwing stones because, like I said, I, 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 I saw that side of, of, the, of the street that wasn't beautiful. And I'm lucky that, I mean, I'm clean. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I don't mess around with drugs. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I'm still a human being. You know what I'm saying? I, at, it, you know, I, I, at any given moment, I can make a choice to medicate myself whenever I want. Nobody's going to say shit. But am I going to do that in a jam? <laughs> Maybe not. You know, not, I don't think that's smart. You know, I may do it in, my, in the comfort of my own home, own home with my girlfriend or something or, you know, my brother or sister or whatever. I don't know. But, uh, but like I said, I'm not criticizing people that do it. I just think that we should, we should be a little bit more responsible in the community because a lot of these jams have little kids. And you, the message you want to give to a little kid is, is art, you know, first. The little kid is going to experience his life and maybe bump into someone at a, in college is going to pull out a joint and, you know, make, make, take that chance and try it and may like it and may not like it and life goes on. So that's part of, you know, just life, you know, these things exist. And, and, but like I said, in the community, you know, it should be a time and a place, you know, that that, that, that happens. <clears throat> Well, this is an interesting topic because when I go, go back to New York uh, today, tomorrow, this weekend is a, a panel conference for, for hip hop at a university that I, and I was invited, invited to speak on the panel and this is actually the material that they wanted to speak about from an outside perspective. The professors are wondering, do we have that freedom? Uh, they, and, uh, and excuse me if I say the topic wrong, it was called emancipated Epis episiologies or epistemology something like that. And it's, the, you know, the, the, the second word I never heard. I had to look it up in the dictionary. I have it on my phone. And I did the research for, for what it was about. The, uh, do we have the freedom? Do we, do, or can we, no, can we, re can we release from what, it, what is and exists right now? Do we have to release from or is it okay to release from? You know, the rules of what we do in art, the rules of what we do in, in hip-hop culture, uh, you know, um, you know, does, can it, does it have to stay the same or can we take it forward, you know, et cetera. So along that, it's kind of similar to what you're saying right now. And it's like, my experience is different. So it's, it's, it's always, for, to have this question answered, asked 39 years later, you know, it's an interesting question, especially in a different country. I'm halfway around the world and we're talking about something that started in New York City when I was 12 years old. I mean, to have this conversation is very interesting. Um, I, I don't believe in, 
particular neighborhood style. I don't believe there's something called Manhattan style or Bronx style or Brooklyn style. I think it's individual style. I say, you know, Jerry from the Bronx, Jerry's got the dope style because Jerry is the one putting the style out. It's the individual that creates that moment and that, rep uh, that reputation for what they did. So, but I, I believe in rules of art, fundamental art. You know, so if there's rules to breaking, those rules should be, exist. And through evolution, they should, they should still be there if you want to really call something what it is. Can we, ch can we evolve and be abstract and take something and do it differently? Of course you can. <laughs> All elements. We've always allowed this. We never discouraged you, you know. Uh, but one thing that I would say about this topic is that what's different now than back in the days, back in the days, you could be creative and interesting, but if it was whack, it was whack. People would be, that shit sucks. Yeah, that's interesting, but it looks whack. Like, do, it's that, that, that aesthetic of attitude and arrogance in hip hop that's part of hip hop, because back in the days you were honest. Does that exist now? I don't, I don't think so. I think everything is super friendly, and people, you know, if you speak up and say something sucks, you'll get attacked by a community and, you know, and people that don't feel the way you feel. And I think it discourages people to say what they really feel. You know, you took your leg and you wrapped it around your head and you did something I never saw before, but didn't have any f flow to it and it looks stupid. What's, what's wrong with saying that? And I think a lot of the community is not doing that now. They're accepting it. Yo, that's the shit. Ah! And I'm like, well, be creative, but sometimes in your creative process, it doesn't mean because you did something no one ever did that it applies to the actual whole concept of what a go-down is and a round should be in breaking. You know, there's a thin line between being a b-boy or a b-girl and being a dope, having a dope flow and just being a, a contortion, contortionist. You know, a person that can fold their body up in 20 different positions, you know, did it make sense? Did it flow? Did, did you, was there any type of character behind your movement? And when that happens, that's dope. When somebody does something interesting, if they're flexible or whatever, or do something crazy, if the flow is there, you feel the flow. You, don't, it's, you can't resist it. When we, when we like something, we like it. But it depends on where you're coming from. Like, I'm not from this era. So my mind is locked into a specific way of, of, of understanding this art at the same time allowing it for me to be open-minded to the evolution. There's a lot of great new breaking that I see and there's a lot of great new breaking that the world sees that's great and I don't. But that's my opinion, that's my choice. So yes, we are allowed to uh, expand and add on to this art form. We, every country has an individual person or people or crew that contributes. Because if that wasn't happening, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be where it is today. Everybody contributes. But once again, as a pioneer, I'm always going to encourage, because I love this art form, that person understands the journey of the art form. Understand the foundation and have some. Why not use foundation? Why, don't, why wouldn't you want to have fundamentals in your vocabulary? They're just more for you to have. Don't exclude everything that's before you. Use everything that was and use it to make it what it can become. You know, so, uh, yeah, I think worldwide people want to, wonder if they have that edge or they need to look like New York. No, be yourself. Be yourself. You know what New York looks like. If it inspires you and you want to look like that, peace. But you don't have to think that you need to look like something to be cool, but you need to play by the rules. The rules are not a person. The rules are the rules. You know, yeah, have some dope footwork, you know, so make sure you mix your stock up. You got all the elements of breaking in there. That's it. That's the rules. Whether you want to dress up or you want to talk a certain way, that's everybody's personal choice. But do I think you have to, you know, have the street feel? If you don't feel that, you shouldn't do it. Don't act like a hard rock. Act like a tough guy or a tough girl. When you, if you're tough and you feel that way, do it. <laughs> but you don't have to put on a front. And a lot of people put on a front. A lot of people, it's such a protective environment now that a lot of people acting all like they about it like that when they're really not. You know, and, and you sometimes you end up seeing it when it gets a little too hectic, and mother and dudes was just like, "Yo, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, 
I'm gonna beat you up now. But when people are like yo, and then you see them, you know, transform into no, no, sorry, no, you know, and you see the act. Now it's like oh, now when it's about to go down, now we see that you're not really built like that, you know. You can do that now in, in these years. Back in the days, you acted like that, you were gonna get approached. And it, well, you wouldn't probably get approached by the b-boy that you were breaking against. A normal dude might be like just hating on you because you're acting tough. And he's a, he's a real tough guy and he's like, oh, this dude thinks he's tough? I mean, that's how it was back. People approach you. People come up on you. What's up, man, you think you hard? You know, like, <laughs> so now to see it, I understand it. It's, it's intimidation, it's part of approaching it, but you don't have to think that you need to look like the Bronx, or Manhattan, or Brooklyn. Uh, I don't think that's the right language. Uh, but I understand it. I understand that people are inspired by the, the story of this of hip hop, so they want to be down, and it's cool. I mean, to me, music has always been the main source of my inspiration. I, I would say. My, the best advice is to, to if, you, if you haven't DJed or played an instrument, incorporate that in your life in general. Just put it in your life. It's because the, the aspect of understanding music and, and loving music and exploring music is it makes you a better b-boy and b-girl automatically, even if you don't realize it or not. I would say that is a very important thing. Uh, be yourself, you know. You can be inspired and but at some point, you know, and you can really want to look like somebody, but at some point you got to let it go and you got to let yourself come out. In the beginning when we're young, we always imitate and we try to be someone, one of our heroes. We try to look like them and that's normal. I did it, everybody does it. But there has to be a point in your growth that, that starts, you, you start coming out. The person that you are and the way you really are comes out and, and that gives you your identity and it makes you who you will become in this community. Uh, and to have fun with it, you know, I mean, use it as an outlet. I would say for any B-boy and B-girl, make sure you have a structure in your life to where, you know, you're, you're, you're getting the proper priorities put into place, you know, school, education, trade, whatever it is, make sure you have a real solid foundation as a, as a young person in the, in the dance community because, you know, I happen to be a person that took, took this ro road, this choice to be to do b-boying in my life, which is a crazy choice. And I have, I've been lucky, I've had opportunities, I was at the right place a lot of times. I struggle, but this is my choice. You know, to become a big star as b-boy and b-girl, I don't know if that's, that's, this is a big world and you have to be a really unique, very interesting and talented and hardworking individual, and it could happen. But I would say always, if you wanna use this as a, as a career, make sure you have something to fall back on. Make sure you have a structure in case it doesn't work, that you have a skill, you have these documents, you have your certifications or whatever it is, so you could still balance it out. You know, I mean, we, as we become adults, we have to pay bills. You know, you, if you want to stay, you know, being a, a child all your life and not be responsible, some people can do that and their parents don't care, but as you grow, as you got to expand and you got to become a young man or woman, life bites you. Life will come and bite you in the ass and be like, oh shit, I got to pay my phone, I got to, you know, I got to work, I need money, I got to eat. You know, I gotta have clothes, whatever. So use it, use it as an outlet, you know, if you, you know, for in general. Training and, and breaking is good for you, it's healthy. You know, it, it challenges the mind and the body. So I would say, you know, those are the main things. And, and, and in the skill, period, uh, skill aspect, try to balance yourself out and be versatile with as many type of skills as possible. Have, a, have more than you need, you know. Uh, challenge yourself on the things you can't do, you know. To, to balance you. You don't want to be one-sided. In 2016, to me, for me to be someone, just one particular approach to it is, that's, that's some 80s stuff, you know, because it was new. Now it's not new anymore, so you should be able to try to do every aspect of breaking and incorporate it into your vocabulary. So that's basically it. The music, like I said, and, and just your identity and being yourself, enjoying hip hop culture, playing an instrument, learning about DJing, learn to tag your name, because it all develops you as a person of hip-hop culture. Mm -hmm.